Now let's see non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Non-steroidal means that they are not steroids or glucocorticoids which inhibit phospholipase A2 and inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandins and leukotrienes wiping inflammation both the beneficial effects and the painful effects altogether. Now NSAIDs mean that some chemicals or drugs which are not steroids but we still use them as an anti-inflammatory, antipyretic and analgesic medicines. Their antipyretic action is due to their central action mostly. The anti-inflammatory action is because the production of pain receptor, the stimulation of pain receptor endings is due to the prostaglandins which are not produced and analgesic effect is due to the same thing. Now let's see how we can classify these NSAIDs for the sake of simplicity or for the sake of complexity, I'm not sure. Let's classify them. Non-selective COX inhibitors, preferentially COX-2 inhibitors and highly specific, yeah, selective COX-2 inhibitors. In non-selective COX inhibitors, first is aspirin, which is a salicylate. Secondly, ibuprofen, which is a propionic acid derivative. Mephenamic acid, which is of course phenamic acid derivative. Ketocorolac and indomethacin. Indomethacin is the most potent NSAID and they both are acetic acid derivatives. Peroxicam which is an enolic acid derivative. All of these were non-selective COX inhibitors. That means they will inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. Preferential COX-2 inhibitors include diclofenic and one CAM that was not in non-selective COX inhibitors is in preferential, which is meloxicam. Now the highly selective COX-2 inhibitors are the COXIB group or Celecoxib. Now I know some of you might think, well where is the famous acetaminophen or paracetamol? Well it did come as a shock to me when I discovered this that acetaminophen was not classified as an NSAID because it's not anti-inflammatory and that means it cannot be classified as NSAID because they are anti-inflammatory. Well that's why they say that the best place to hide is in plain sight. Let's see the mechanism of action of NSAIDs. We know that there are two types of COX enzymes, COX-1 and COX-2. They basically inhibit both or selectively the COX-2 which is inducible in inflammation. Thus prostaglandins and leukotrienes are not formed and thus they form anti-inflammatory, analgesic and antiplatelet and antipyretic functions. Aspirin is irreversible COX inhibitor while others are reversible. So aspirin can be used as an antiplatelet too because in the 7 to 10 days of life of platelets only once if the COX enzymes in the platelets are inhibit, inhibited they can never do platelet aggregation then. Let's see the pharmacological actions. Now we've already discussed the analgesic property is because the prostaglandins are not produced which do not sensitize the peripheral nerves, nociceptors. Antipyretic action is mainly central and uh, the hypothalamus thermo, thermostat or thermoregulatory center, it produces prostaglandins which are inhibited. Analgesic effect is in the thalamus in the, due to the blockade of the pain relay pathways and also local that I described. Anti-inflammatory action is because of course COX-1, COX-2 are inhibited. COX-2 is mainly responsible for inflammation due to the production of PGs and leukotrienes. Antiplatelet effect is also there because thromboxane A2 is inhibited which is responsible for platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction. 
Now let's look at the adverse effects of uh, NSAIDs. Now there are a whole lot of them, so we'll discuss them separately. First, let's look at the GIT side effects. The GIT side effects are due to the aspirin irritating the gastric mucosa, producing nausea, vomiting, and dyspepsia. It also stimulates chemotrigger zone and produces vomiting. Next is the acid base and electrolyte balance. Now, basically, they are the uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation. That means increased respiration, which is an autonomic reflex, and decreased plasma carbon dioxide concentration leading to alkalosis. Now CVS disturbances are mainly of three types. One is chronic use of NSAIDs cause sodium and water retention which can precipitate congestive cardiac failure and also decrease the efficacy of diuretics and antihypertensive medications. Secondly, it also, also interferes with vitamin K action in liver leading to hypoprothrombinemia and decreased clotting factors leading to bleeding. In G G6PD deficiency patient, deficient patients, it can lead to hemolytic anemia, mostly aspirin. Now the adverse effects related to the hypersensitivity are more common with aspirin, such as skin rash, urticaria, rhinitis, bronchospasm. Bronchospasm is mainly due to the increased leukotriene production, probably because as COX is inhibited, the only enzyme left is lipoxygenase, which produces leukotrienes. So the arachidonic acid goes to that pathway and increased leukotriene production is there, leading to bronchospasm. Angioneurotic edema. You need to Google this one. And rarely anaphylactoid reactions. Another important adverse effect related mostly to aspirin is Reyes syndrome. We should not give aspirin to children or teenagers who have or had recently a viral infection such as smallpox, etc. Now, Reyes syndrome is manifested as hepatic damage and fatty infiltration of the liver uh, and as well as encephalopathy. The next one is mainly a contraindication in pregnancy that bec because prostaglandins are not produced which are involved in uterine contraction so there is delayed onset of labor and increased postpartum hemorrhage and hemorrhage due to thromboxane A2 inhibition of course and in the newborn premature closure of ductus arteriosus. The nephropathy caused by NSAIDs is due to the chronic use of NSAIDs and they are usually reversible. The nephropathy occurs due to the decreased formation of PGI2 and PGE2 which usually maintains GFR and renal blood flow by vasodilation. To avoid this, Solendac can be used which has no renal effects but is involved in hypersensitivity reactions. Lastly, there is urate interference because urate is a weak acid and so are NSAIDs. So they compete for excretion and thus there is uh, hyperuricemia though in higher doses there is, as they are ne nephrotoxic so they can decrease the uric acid in the blood and increase it in the urine. Now let's see what sort of poisoning occurs in NSAIDs overdosage. One is the mild form which is called salicism and the other is acute salicylate poisoning. The mild salicism uh, is associated with the CNS symptoms such as headache, tinnitus, otigo, confusion, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, 
hyperapnea, electrolyte disturbances, etc. It can be reversible if the therapy is stopped. Acute salicylate poisoning is most common in children. It is associated with vomiting, dehydration, probably due to hyperventilation, vomiting and fever, hyperapnea due to the uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, increasing respiratory attrition, which is an autonomic response, Rest restlessness, coma, convulsions, cardiovascular collapse, pulmonary edema, hyperpyrexia and death. So you can see now that some pains you need to endure yourself without aspirin. The treatment for acute salicylate poisoning is hospitalization, of course, gastric lavage. Activated charcoal is used which acts as a physical antagonist. The electrolyte balance and fluid balance is maintained. IV sodium bicarbonate is given to make the urine alkaline and increase the secre uh, excretion of aspirin. Hemodialysis may be necessary in some cases and vitamin K and blood transfusions in case of bleeding. Let's see some drug interactions now. NSAIDs should not be given with glucocorticoids because gluco glucocorticoids inhibit phospholipase A2 and can cause GI complications potentiation. NSAIDs should not be given with oral anticoagulants, oral hypoglycemic drugs because they displace them from plasma protein binding sites and increase their toxicity. NSAID should not be given with lithium because it impairs its clearance and leads to its toxicity and thiazides and furosemides which are diuretics should not be given with NSAIDs because chronic NSAIDs promote sodium and water retention and decrease their efficacy. Now the uses as we can already see they can be analgesic, antipyretic, antiplatelet and anti inflammatory in conditions such as uh, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatic fever etc. They just improve the sim symptoms of the patient. They, are, they can also be used in thromboembolic disorders which is mis mainly aspirin is used for this case, low dose aspirin which is about 75 milligrams and aspirin has the most disadvantages. Now let's talk a bit about acetaminophen or paracetamol. It is not anti-inflammatory so it's not an NSAID. It is lipid soluble so it crosses blood brain barrier and has only CNS effects on the hypothalamus and thalamus. It has no peripheral actions. If it doesn't have any peripheral actions that means it has no antiplatelet activity. It has minimal GI distress. It does not disrupt the acid-base balance. It doesn't have any effect on uric acid excretion. It is not bronchospastic. It does not cause Reyes syndrome. It only has antipyretic and analgesic effects. It also lacks all these side effects, still they left it out of the classification. Good people are left out. Its CNS effects are on the hypothalamus and thalamus. In the hypothalamus it acts on the thermoregulatory center to treat pyrexia and in the, in the thalamus, it uh, interferes with the pain pathway to treat pain. To understand the poisoning caused by acetaminophen, we need to understand the metabolism of paracetamol or acetaminophen. We need to know that mostly it is me metabolized by conjugation by glucuronyl transferase in the liver to form inactive conjugates. But there is a minor pathway via P450 which forms toxic free radicals causing liver damage. Now, usually we have glutathione in our cells as antioxidant to deal with these uh, free radicals, but there is a limited supply of glutathione. So when that is depleted, there is liver damage from the center of the hepatic lobule because in the center there is most P450 and this leads to centrilobular 
necrosis and fulminant hepatitis. Now in the management, we need to replenish the glutathione by N-acetylcysteine or methionine sulfhydryl groups. Other management is supportive and the general management in toxic toxicology. Now in the end, let's look at some important properties of individual NSAIDs. For example, keto -corallac It is the most potent analgesic and almost equal to morphine. It is used in the treatment of urinal colic because keto -corallac some somehow sounds like colic. Endomethacin is a potent anti-inflammatory drug. It is used in the treatment of gout, arthritis, etc. Its GI side effects are very prominent as are the CNS side effects. Such as confusion, hallucinations, etc. Pyroxicam is a long-acting NSAID. Mephenamic acid is used in arthritis and rheumatic fever, etc. Ibuprofen is safe in children. Diclofenac is hepatotoxic, but it is very potent anti-inflammatory and reaches high concentrations in synovial fluid, so that is why it is used to treat arthritis pain, as well as, as anti-inflammatory. Celecoxib is very gastric friendly with minimal GI irritation and pep peptic ulcer chances. Edema in kidney is due to sodium and water retention. Cardiovascular thrombotic events can occur due to decreased PGI2 and thromboxane A2 is not affected. Now to summarize, non-selective COX inhibitors have antiplatelet effect while selective COX2 have no antiplatelet action. Though GI side effects of non-selective COX inhibitors are very high compared to the highly selective COX-2 inhibitors which do not cause GI side effects. I know that was a lot to cover but I hope you understood it. Thanks for watching.